All right, today we're going to talk about the various different groups that lived in Texas. We're going to see how soldiers lived differently from missionaries, lived differently from mission Indians, lived differently from civilian settlers. And then we're going to talk about things ha like race, class, and gender, and how each of these affected life of people in Spanish Texas. So we're not going to talk much about people of missions, because we've talked a lot about missions already. Just know that a good chunk of Texas's population in the early 1700s is going to be Mission Indians. Okay, these are groups like the Coltecans in San Antonio, tiny handful again of Caddos and Los Ades, tiny handful of Caracuas, who voluntarily uh, entered this mission system to learn Catholicism and to um, become Hispanicized. Well, for these first groups. Uh, what would happen is you'd move into these missions, you'd help build the mission a lot of times, you would accept instruction, and you would go out every day, harvest crops, uh, bring your crops in here, you know, make a residence here and within the mission complex, give a portion of your crop to missionaries, and then repeat the next day. Again, after 10 years, maybe you become Hispanicized, um, and you can start, you can speak Spanish, you're fully Catholic. Your children be, uh, are going to be raised Catholic, a lot of them not even speaking their native language, uh, and um, essentially become Spanish citizens. So these missions started out early 1700s, and by 1750 or so, we have a number of first, second generation, even a couple third generation uh, mission Indians. And again, if you're a missionary, you would come out to these areas, you would establish a mission, you would live in in the mission, usually a couple missionaries per mission, you would hold church services. Sometimes missionaries would receive a diff different assignment later in life, other times they would spend their entire lives at a single mission, uh, die at that mission, um, and that's it. Um, so that's the general life of mission Indians. Usually Mission Indians uh, are going to stay in missions, especially if you're a first generation, you enter into a mission. You're going to be expected to stay in this for the rest of your life. Maybe over time, if you become Hispanicized, the missionaries will uh, allow you to leave the mission, um, work for a civilian, maybe sometimes a few instances acquire your own land. Children of mission Indians, sometimes missionaries would expect them to stay in the mission like they were still too Indian to be out on their own. Sometimes this was done because missionaries truly believed they hadn't embraced the word of God. Other times it's sort of missionaries don't want to leave the mission. They're used to Spain funding their missionary efforts. They want to get other Indians in there and they think that if they, you know, uh, start reporting that we only have 20 mission Indians here instead of 100, then Spain's going to start sending or you know stop sending as much money, and uh, the efforts efforts to Christianize will be hurt. So a lot of times Spain kept Indians past the point they were Hispanicized, even second, third generation Indians. So that is the uh, missionaries. It, and again, after second generation into third generation, you still had some fully Hispanicized mission Indians, but usually by that point the Indians would ex be expected to leave the mission and um, live in Spanish society. Another group that we call, uh, is going to call Texas home in the mid 1700s is Spanish soldiers. Okay, so Spain would hire these men, as always men, although they would bring their families usually to go to these presidios and Texas is going to have a number of presidios. Uh, there'll be presidio at Los Ades, La Bahia, San Antonio, San Juan Batista, also over here in El Paso. Uh, again, these are the only three making up what uh, what's the Spanish consider Texas, but you uh, get hired, you're going to be paid a monthly stipend, and in a perfect world with these uh, soldiers would be expected to do is live in these presidios, sometimes bring their families with them, a lot of other times it's just single men, and you get up there to Texas and your main job is going to be preventing Indian attacks. So while the um, um, missionaries are doing their job or while civilian settlers, you know, they're trying to uh, herd their cattle, you'll have groups. First it's going to be the Apaches, later on we're going to talk about these Comanches coming in who will try to steal the cattle, attack mission Indians while they're out in the fields, try to steal European goods. And it's going to be up to these soldiers to try to prevent these attacks or to retaliate if the Indians attack and, and take off. So if an Apache comes in, 
raid San Antonio, steal some cattle. Spanish soldiers at the Presidio, in a perfect world, would get on their horses, grab um, their firearms, usually going to carry a small single shot pistol. They didn't have automatic weapons, multi shot weapons back then, usually a rifle. A lot of times, a big uh, weapon they're going to use are these lances. So if you're chasing after somebody they're on foot you can lance them or if you catch up to them on a horse you can lance them throw them off their horse they didn't wear uh, the heavy metal stuff that's too hot so Spanish soldiers again in a perfect world would be wearing these uh, Quera or leather jackets uh, usually they're thick enough to deflect arrows um, also these leather shields could deflect arrows as well you see the guy's rifle right there and again in a perfect world you'd be uh, riding a horse that's very well fed and Spain actually required their soldiers to maintain multiple horses so you keep maybe your best horse and you have four or five other horses that you know you maintain so you go off on campaign one horse gets tired you, you can ride the next one all right so um oh and here's you actually can see a list of the different things they they require um pants um you know certain types of boots things like that so protecting its indians you're also as a spanish soldier supposed to return mission indians if they escape from the mission so missionaries they get indians to come in the mission and they basically force them to accept this idea that if once you come in you can't leave until you're fully Hispanicized. If you leave, then uh, we can send soldiers to go out there, return you to these missions. So that that would be one duty of a soldier. A mission, an Indian says, I want to accept your protection. I want to le learn Catholicism. Changes their mind, leaves. Soldiers can track them down uh, and then bring them back in. Um, so that's one of the jobs of these uh, soldiers in Texas. Another job of soldiers is to protect against French invasion. We talked about that very brief chicken war, but there's always the threat. In spite of the fact that Spain and France are, uh, their royal families are closely related, they're not, you know, under the same uh, official crown anymore uh, like they were for that very brief period. So there is the fear that the French are going to move in and invade uh, later on, you know, once the British start coming in and they build up their navy, maybe even the possibility of a naval invasion. So soldiers at the various presidios got to be prepared in case of um, in case of a French invasion. Now, thankfully for soldiers, this French invasion, the French are going to have a lot of difficulty if they invade Texas. So Los Ades would probably fall really easily if the French decide to invade because you just got this presidio not very many civilian settlers here at Los Ades and, and again very few missionized Indians here and so this will probably fall pretty easily because of the poor roads in Texas if the French want to invade they're gonna have to cross a lot of territory where there's not any people or at least any non-Indians uh, in these poor roads so it's almost a deterrent the fact that there's uh, so little settlement in Texas so by the time they get to San Antonio and La Bahia they're, they're gonna be starting to run out of supplies so uh, you're protecting against French invasion along with again um, uh, the environment protecting you against French invasion if the French somehow did get in here then it'd have to be up to the soldiers at San Antonio and La Bahia to protect um, against the French taking either of those cities okay so that's one of your other jobs uh, as a soldier soldier in Spanish Texas final thing that uh, soldiers are supposed to be doing in Spanish Texas is to oh, uh, you know one other thing I guess before I mention this final thing also to keep order there's no police forces in Texas uh, at this time so if the governor let's say there's a um, domestic assault charge against a man he's been uh, hitting his wife the uh, governor wants him arrested he's going to go to the Presidio commander send some soldiers to this guy maybe he's uh, ran out of town go capture him bring him to me so soldiers would almost be a police force in Texas as well final thing that soldiers are going to do is to prevent contraband trading between Louisiana and Texas and this is going to be a huge deal because again most people in Texas are getting their goods from Mexico City and Mexico City gets a lot of its goods all the way from Spain so it's got to go all the way across this ocean down to Mexico City 
Uh, right there, it's a lot of travel time. And then it's got to go all the way overland, which is a very inefficient way to bring goods, all the way up here to Labrado before going to San Antonio, before going to Los Cedes. Imagine if you're a soldier here in Los Cedes or you're a civilian here. By the time the goods make their way over and get all the way up here, uh, the good stuff's going to be picked over. The goods may be, um, you know, um, uh, from overlay transport might be messed up. Imagine how expensive it would be to get porcelain from China. Usually it would go to Spain or go to the Philippines and come back this direction and make its way up here. Probably not going to be any uh, pieces that are unbroken by the time it makes its way to San Antonio. And then any fine goods, any manufactured goods, any manufactured textiles they're probably not going to make their way up here. Again, part of the reason is because there's not a lot of market, because as we're about to talk about, there's not a lot of way to, ways to make money here in Texas. So um, uh, if you wanted a nice European good, one of the best and easiest ways and cheapest, and actually it's going to be by far cheaper way to get some of these goods, is to get this stuff from the French in Canada. So the French bring it over from France, they arrive in Canada, send it down to the Great Lakes, and then it flows down river, down this Mississippi, makes its way to Natchitoches, and you've got nice silver here, you've got some nice textiles, you've got some nice uh, goods here. Well, if you're somebody over here, you're not supposed to trade with the French or fear the Spanish. There's certain occasions they'll allow trade, but most instances, the Spanish want the uh, people from New Spain or from their whole empire to get goods exclusively from Spain. Now, the French will trade with anybody. Um, occasionally, they'll have laws against it, but you have all these nice European goods. Hey, guys. I'd like to sell this stuff to you. I'm going to make a little bit of a profit. You're going to get goods way cheaper than you can get if they were shipped over here. Why don't I sell this stuff? Well, if you're a Spanish soldier, you're supposed to be patrolling along this frontier, not only watching for invasion, but also watching to prevent these contraband goods coming across. So, um, you know, it, soldiers will absolutely do this as a job, but a lot of times these soldiers, particularly those here in Los Ades, I'm not getting the goods I want. They have them over here. Uh, all right, I'm going to turn the other way, let you buy. Maybe you give me a couple dollars, turn the other way, and I'm going to let this trade go through. A lot of times, soldiers are going to be involved in this uh, contraband trade, not making very much money out here on the frontier. And uh, and so that they'll be involved in that contraband trade themselves, and then you know they bring the goods down here. Now, again, part of this reason is just the reality of um, things in Texas. But the other thing, problem is that, uh, reason you're going to see stuff like this, is that soldiers in Texas, a lot of these guys were criminals. Uh, Texas is a very remote province in the Spanish Empire. Spain, again, not a lot of people coming to the New World from Spain to, that are, you know, upstanding citizens that want to be a soldier. If you're an upstanding citizen, you might be getting a government job, you might be getting a uh, land grant to work a mine. There's ways to make money here besides being a soldier. Some uh, prominent individuals from Spain would want to become a soldier. It's one of the few ways you can raise your social status back in Spain. So sometimes you would get uh, prominent people that want to become soldiers. But a lot of times it wouldn't be the best individuals. Uh, initially, Spain, perfect world, they were hoping for only people from Spain to serve in the military. But eventually they're going to allow you know people born within the colonies themselves to serve as soldiers but it's going to get to the point where even that won't uh, you know fill the presidios in Texas so what a lot of times the Spanish would do is use uh, service in Texas as punishment for a crime so this remote province Indian attacks there's a lot of uh, fatalities for soldiers there so you're somebody let's say central uh, New Spain, maybe somebody around Mexico City, you convicted of a crime, rape, uh, robbery, something like that. Well, instead of locking you up six years in jail and then you become a drain on the Spanish treasury, you're going to serve out six years on the frontier of Texas, okay? Most of the time, you'd actually get, even get paid for this job, but it was such a, a uh, tough duty that it would be the service for a crime. Now, you get these criminals out here on the frontier, not going to be the best of soldiers and a lot of times they're going to be engaged in things like contraband trade okay so that's going to be the soldiers jobs and again we have the, these problems with soldiers but soldiers even those that are 
uh, you know, qualified individuals, those that aren't sent for a crime, because you will get some people joining uh, the military and then just having to get stationed out on Texas. These guys are going to face a lot of problems because Texas is so far from Mexico City, where the Viceroy's at, and again, that's so far from Spain, that a lot of times the supplies that are supposed to reach soldiers, because again, we have this huge distance from here. Let's imagine you are wanting to get guns to Los Ades, okay, or this nice leather armor. Soldiers are supposed to wear these nice uniforms, these nice boots, uh, have these nice shields. Uh, well, you got to get this goods out here. All right, you send them over from Spain, the nicest guns that are pr produced in Spanish uh, Empire, uh, head through Sevilla, and then come down here, go to Mexico City, make their way up, make them through San Antonio. Well, at every stop along this way, you're going to have maybe a commander of a Presidio down here, maybe the uh, goes through San Juan Batista, the Presidio commander here, sees the firearms, so I'm going to take a couple of the better ones. Presidio Commander at San Antonio, I'm going to take a couple of the better ones. By the time they get to Los Ades, the guns that are left are going to be poorly manufactured. And so, um, again, this is going to help contribute to contraband trade. Hey, the French over here have nice guns, but the ones I'm getting from down here are uh, are just junk because everybody else has took the best stuff. And a lot of times you'll see these soldiers um, with malfunctioning firearms, you know, don't have the proper ammunition or, or gunpowder because it didn't make its way up to the top. A lot of times soldiers, their uniforms were incomplete, so they rarely look like this. Sometimes their pants would be falling apart. Sometimes their boots would have holes in them. And you actually get descriptions of uh, Spanish soldiers on the frontier as uh, being half naked because they, um, uh, because of they're so poorly supplied. Okay. Not only that, Spanish soldiers a lot of times didn't get proper pay, and it's for, again, a lot of the same reasons. So you get, it's kind of interesting, you get the silver produced in this area, it goes all the way down to Mexico City where it gets minted, turned into coins. These coins make their way up and again stopping at s different provinces, different cities where you have a lot of corrupt individuals. Maybe they skim off the top here. Forget about the fact there's also uh, bandits and again and you start getting into some of these areas in southern Texas around this area. Uh, you, you still have a lot of um, uh, non-Hispanicized Indians. Maybe up here you'll see Apache raids. Maybe some of these shipments get stopped before they get out, all the way out here. And so you have corrupt individuals skipping off the top, raids, things like that. By the time it gets out to Los Ades or San Antonio, La Bahia, maybe it's not near the shipment that you were expecting. So soldiers, they'll tell them, so sorry buddy, um, you have to go out uh, without pay for a month or two months or sometimes six months or more to um, uh, before you actually get paid. So again, if people don't want to serve in Texas for a lot of other reasons, that's an additional reason. It, it's just uh, you're not going to get paid very much or get very irregular pay. Okay, so that's another problem here with uh, being a soldier in Texas. An additional problem is that a lot of times the commanders of these various presidios aren't going to be the best soldiers. So here would be a presidio. This is what it would look like, something like this. You would have usually a barracks. Um, this would be maybe where they store the ammunition. This would be maybe the officer's quarter, something like that. Uh, actually, this would probably be where the um, uh, soldiers are stationed. But a lot of times, the uh, uh, presidios wouldn't have enough room for soldiers, so you just have uh, them set up tents outside of this thing. A lot of these would be tents for families because, again, some soldiers are going to bring their families with them. Uh, and you would usually actually have um, a church in each of these presidios. So maybe this is the church. Maybe this is the uh, commander's quarters. And uh, a presidio would look something like this. It was sort of an, a, a community on its own. And again, if you're a place like San Antonio, you'd have the missions down the road. You would interact with them. You'd interact with soldiers. Oh, I'm sorry, civilian settlements. But the Presidio itself would be its own uh, community. Well, imagine if you are a Presidio that's not right next to a civilian settlement, and you have a very bad commander. Okay, This is going to be somebody that is in charge of your pay, in charge of getting you supplies, in charge of coordinating campaigns. So word arrives, there's an Indian attack. Commander, everybody get on your horses. Let's go. Retaliating against these guys. Well, 
it's fine if everything is if you got a good guy he's qualified he's competent he's going to give you your pay on time he's going to make sure you get the right supplies he's going to lead you on a coordinated campaign not going to um, put your life in danger but occasionally and well I shouldn't say occasionally a lot of times uh, you would get commanders in Texas and in particular because it was such a poor place to get posted who were just bad at their jobs and they were incredibly co corrupt um, and they would just be uh, incredibly uh, skim off the top and they would just cause more problems than uh, soldiers could deal with okay so I'm just going to give you one example of a bad Presidio commander and the problems that can come out of it. Now this isn't um, Felipe de Rabago y Tehran, but this poor individual, it's a drawing of a uh, Presidio commander from the mid-1700s. So he's going to have to stand in for uh, Felipe de Rabago y Tehran. Well, Felipe de Rabago y Tehran was the kind of individual you would sometimes see being stationed to Texas, okay? He was um, a member of a prestigious family that had been born in New Spain. So his family initially came from Spain, but had been in multiple generations in New Spain. So as we're going to talk about, maybe his family been born in Spain, he might have been achieving a higher position. Maybe if uh, he was the firstborn child of uh, the Spanish individual, that the Spain they regarded firstborn sons as more elite status than second or third born son but he was the um, the third born son of a family b born in, um, in within New Spain so right there he's got a couple knocks on him he's uh, you know not from Spain itself and not the first born son so what you would see a lot of times with these prestigious families they would try to find as prestigious a military or civilian position for their second or third born sons as possible. Well, Felipe de Rabago y Tehran, his family will arrange for him to join the military at a young age. He's going to have pretty poor performance in the military, but because his family has some pull, he's going to make his way up in the ranks, eventually gaining the uh, title of commander. And in 1751, there's going to be a plan to build a new Presidio in Texas, and Felipe de Rabago y Tehran will be the one chosen to run this per, uh, Presidio. Okay, basically, um, missionaries this is going to be a short attempt to establish missions among this group of Indians called the Cocos. You can kind of think of them as Caracuas, but also Coiltecans. They, you know, they're one of these groups that you can't fit perfectly into any particular group because they would plant food occasionally but for the most part they would uh, hunt and, and wander most of the year so maybe for, for the purposes of this class think of as Karank was well you know uh, they'd ask missionaries to establish missions among them so a group of missionaries are going to establish two missions right right in this area and being distant from San Antonio, they wanted a Presidio to protect the missions. They didn't want it exactly by the missions because, again, sometimes there could be problems between soldiers and mission Indians. So just station it a little bit off. All right, we need this new Presidio. Who's going to run it? Well, Felipe de Rabago y Turan family will uh, speak with people they know in Mexico City, and uh, they will put him in charge of it. So 1751. Uh, Felipe de Rabago y Tehran will be chosen to run this Presidio. So uh, he, he learns about this and uh, his family learns about this central New Spain. He's supposed to make his way up as soon as possible. Instead of heading right up to uh, the new uh, San Xavier mission, he's going to take his time, you know, meandering about. Eventually he's going to make his way to San Antonio. While he's in San Antonio, uh, actually construction already begun on the Presidio. He's going to need to recruit a couple civilians to help him with the Presidio. He's going to run across a particular individual named Juan Jose Sabalos. Uh, Juan Jose Sabalos is a tailor and a barber. And uh, Felipe Rabago y Tehran thinks, all right, I need somebody to maintain my soldiers' uniforms, cut their hair, things like that. And he's going to hire Juan Jose Sabalos to join him in the San Xavier Presidio. Well, Juan Jose Sabalos will is married, got a beautiful wife, and he's going to request permission from Bagui Tehran to bring his wife. Well, um, 
uh, Felipe de Rabagui Tehran will approve of this, and he actually approves of it very quickly, suspicious like quickly. While well, Rabagui Tehran, Sabalos, and Sabalos' wife make their way to the San Xavier Presidio in late 1751, and very soon uh, Rabagui Tehran and Sabalos' wife begin an affair. Sabalos hears about the affair, he's going to confront. Rubagui Tehran about the affair. And again, remember, Rubagui Tehran in this Presidio, except for these missions, they're far away from civilian authorities in San Antonio, far from the governor. By the way, the governor is, is mostly going to be located in San Antonio, even though they're supposed to be in Los Ades, but governor here in San Antonio, far away. Well, Sabalos, he, he confronts Rubagui Tehran, and Rubagui Tehran is sitting here basically in his own empire in this Presidio, and Sabalos says something, Rabagui Tron doesn't like the accusation, so what he's going to do is he's actually going to lock up Sabalos in the Presidio jail. Not only does he rock, lock him up, but um, he will basically move a bed into the Presidio jail, and Rabagui Tron is going to make love to Sabalos' wife and force Sabalos to watch. Now, Sabalos, again, distant from other uh, Spanish authorities, uh, and he's locked in jail. What's he supposed to do about this? Well, fortunately for him, on this Christmas day, he will escape from jail, and he's going to run to the closest place he can find, which is the San Xavier missions. There are a number of a uh, couple priests in these uh, various missions, um, uh, including a priest named Jose Gonzabal. Jose Gonzabal is running these missions. Sabalos is going to make his way here. Uh, he's going to ask for sanctuary. The, he explains um, uh, he explains what uh, Rabagui Teronomy doing had been doing. The missionaries are going to give him sanctuary. Um, Rabagui Teron actually hears that Sabalos had run da down here, and he comes here trying to get the missionaries to give him up. But the missionaries tell him, no, we've offered him sanctuary. You don't have authority of these missions. You go back to your presidio. So we have this incident. The missionaries are then going to send word to officials in San Antonio about what Rabago Tehran has done. Well, in the meantime, because it's going to take a while for word to get down here and word to get back, and actually I should just go ahead and point out, word initially is going to get here, the uh, governor of Texas will say, okay, there's got to be something wrong here. I've heard Rabago Tehran has got his stuff together. This isn't, uh, there's got to be something messed up. You know, this didn't happen the way Sabalos is describing it. So Sabalos will be forced to sit in this mission in 17, into 1752. All right, well, so uh, Sabalos here, the missionaries, uh, they already have a disagreement with Presidio. Well, very quickly it's going to be learned that the couple missions, uh, Indians that have come into these missions, word will arrive that the soldiers at the San Xavier Presidio are paying some of the mission Indians for not just work, which um, uh, again, there's going to be some issue with, uh, you know, uh, can mission Indians, you pay mission Indians for work. You know, again, we talked about some instances where that'll be dictated, but in this this uh, particular case, missionaries think, no, mission Indians only work for us. And then there's going to be accusations that soldiers at the San Xavier Presidio, with Rabagui Tehran's permission, are actually paying mission Indian women to have sex with them. So there'll be, uh, uh, and, you know, accusations that the soldiers will be paying the husbands of Mission Indian women to have sex with the Mission Indian uh, women. So that will start reaching Jose Gonzabal, the head of the, the missions at San Xavier. Well, Gonzabal is going to, again, he's going to send word down to San Antonio. This is what these soldiers are doing. And again, he's going to get no reply from the governor. So Jose Gonzabal is going to make the decision to take matters into his own hands. What he's going to do is he's going to excommunicate Rabagui Tehran and all the soldiers at the San Xavier Presidio. Excommunicate means to uh, take away uh, uh, their, how should I describe this? They're, they're excommunicated from the church. They're forced to leave the church, which is a huge deal in, in Catholic Spanish society because if you're forced to leave the church, there goes your salvation. It's almost condemning somebody to go to hell. Um, so this is a big deal to these soldiers at San Xavier that they've been excommunicated. And uh, Rabago Tehran is obviously 
going to be upset. He's going to try to force the uh, priest to rescind their excommunications. Father Gonzabal is going to refuse to do so. Well, a couple months will pass by after the excommunication until May 1752. Uh, at, uh, in May uh, 1752, actually May 11, 1752, Father Gonzabal, Sabalos, who's still at these missions, and, an, and another friar will be sitting outside of one of the San Xavier missions when they're going to hear a sound in the dark. Um, they go to investigate. The uh, A shot is going to ring out this uh, from a musket. It will, uh, the gun will, uh, musket ball, I guess I should say, will hit Sabalos, um, kill him. So the man whose uh, uh, wife, Rabagui Turan, was sleeping with, uh, he will die. And Father Gonzabal will get shot with an arrow uh, to the heart. And a second priest will receive a, a, a musket ball, but he's going to end up surviving. Okay? So we've had priest here at the St. Xavier Missions killed, and a civilian uh, who had again accused uh, Rabagui Turan of sleeping with his wife, he's also been killed, and a third, uh, third person, a second friar, will have been injured. Well, now the governor of, of Texas can no longer ignore what's going on, so he's going to order an investigation of what's happening, and this is going to mean calling up priests, calling up soldiers, calling up Rabagui Turan, and calling mission Indians to testify on what happened here. Well, when they call up, um, a lot of soldiers stick to their story. Hey, we, you know, um, and a lot of times it's going to be ordered by Rabagui Turan, don't say anything. Uh, and so soldiers are sort of going to stick by one another, although some are going to talk about Rabagui Turan, how he's a poor presidio commander. The uh, surviving priest will talk about, you know, what has been happening with the soldiers and their uh, complaints about them. And as the governor's going through these various people and the way they would run these uh, courts is they simply have people testify and you can go look up all these old documents if you want. They will write down everything they say and then sign off, have the people sign off on these documents. Well, they're going to call up one mission Indian uh, uh, here, one of the missions who uh, Indians have been att attending the San Xavier mission. And he's going to testify that Rabagui Turan had paid him to execute uh, the the friars and Sabalos and he's going to say not only him but other soldiers from the San Xavier Presidio were those who had fired on the priest and killed uh, Father Gonzabal and Sabalos. Well based on this testimony the governor will order Rabago y Tehran placed under house arrest uh, Mission Indians also going to be paid, placed under arrest as well. Uh, Rabagui Turan will be taken to San Antonio, briefly placed in jail, but then because it's going to take so long to get down to Mexico City uh, and because Rabagui Turan is from a wealthy family, uh, the governor is going to decide to send him to a different presidio to be kept in house arrest for a brief amount of time. He's actually sent to San Juan Batista where he's going to actually continue to serve until a final judgment can be made on whether he was guilty about um, uh, of being guilty of uh, uh, of killing the priest. Well, during this time, the uh, the actual the presidio commander of San Juan Batista he gets uh, ill or he gets a different assignment. This is actually going to allow Rabagui Turan under house arrest to take over command of the San Juan Batista presidio, and shortly thereafter. Um, he will eventually meet with the Viceroy of New Spain. The Viceroy is going to determine, hey, this guy's not actually guilty. Again, uh, what Rabagui Turan will argue is that my conviction, governor convicted me based on the fact that it was a uh, mission Indian said this. And, um, you know, uh, this mission Indian, not a high standing individual. Uh, another person to testify that particular Indian had sold his wife uh, into prostitution for a soldier. So Rabagui Turan will argue successfully, how can we trust this individual who um, is known to uh, prostitute his wife? The Viceroy will agree with him, and Rabagui Turan is going to be placed back in charge of the San Xavier Presidio. As we're going to talk about a little bit later, it's actually the Presidio will move to a different location, but he's placed back in charge of it. So this guy gets away with this. Uh, well, it's actually kind of interesting when Rabagui Turan is placed back in charge of this San Xavier Presidio, the guy who had been running it in his absence, he had uh, gone off to get supplies. He learns 
in his absence that Rabagli Tehran has replaced him. The guy gets upset and basically starts complaining that this convicted criminal has replaced him, and he starts saying to Spanish officials, this is ridiculous, I should continue to maintain uh, control of the Presidio. Rabagli Tehran hears about this guy complaining about him, and Rabagli Tehran will sell all of that guy's stuff. He simply sells his stuff um, uh, before he can return to the Presidio and get it, and then he starts a smear campaign uh, against the guy who, who was complaining about Rabagli Tehran. Bagui Tehran, we'll briefly talk about this later. He's going to uh, have such a horrible remainder of his career as a commander of the Presidio that at one point he doesn't uh, get enough supplies for his men and they actually start ha getting scurvy because they don't need enough vitamin C. Uh, he's going to, as we'll talk about a little bit later, uh, allow a uh, nearby mission to get attacked. He's just going to have a horrible, um, horrible career as a Presidio commander. But because Rabagui Tehran is um, has family members of a prestigious family in New Spain, all that's going to be forgiven, and he will receive a knighthood um, as a uh, shortly before his death. So, doesn't matter what you do. A lot of times in the Spanish Empire, especially out here on the frontier, if you know people uh, within Central New Spain, it's, it's more about who you know than how you perform. All right, so that's life of a soldier. Again, if you're a guy at the top, things are okay, but if you're a guy that has to serve under somebody like Rabagoli Tehran, it can obviously be uh, bad. Alright, well, what about um, other people in Spanish Texas? What about civilians? So we talked about uh, we've got missions and, and soldiers, but we've also had civilian settlers move up here. We talked about Canary Islanders, and a handful of other settlers have come in from New Spain and started moving around San Antonio, La Bahia, a handful around Los Cedes. Well, these guys get here. How are they supposed to make their lives? What are they supposed to do? Well, most people that uh, Spaniards that are going to move to Texas are going to make their lives as farmers. So this is going to be primarily subsistence farmers, not selling uh, uh, your goods to the market. And in part, it's going to be difficult to sell goods because, say, you're around San Antonio. Sure, you can sell stuff locally, but a lot of people around the area are growing the same stuff you're growing. So why would they buy it from you when they can grow it themselves? And then if you're trying to trade it outside of, hey, maybe you sell it here, San Juan, Batista, or Laredo, but if you're trying to sell it to where the large population centers are down here, by the time it gets down there, it's spoiled. They don't have refrigeration cards, anything like that. So most of the farmers in uh, in Texas are going to be what you would call subsistence farmers. They grow enough to survive, for, enough for themselves and for their families, uh, but not much more to ship. And again, part of that's going to be because it's so difficult to ship products back then before refrigeration. So the people of Texas, these civilians are going to grow things like corn, beans, and squash, the same things Indians grow. grew. Um, missionaries and civilian settlers will try to introduce crops they're used to uh, uh, from Europe, things like wheat, but they simply don't grow well in the climate of Texas. So um, the big stuff like uh, uh, will be corn, beans, and squash, the same things that uh, many American Indians had grown and continued to grow in Texas during this time. You will see a little bit of people growing some European crops like wheat and citrus fruits, but for the most part, they just don't grow as well in Texas. So again, you see watermelons here. Watermelon's a type of squash. That would be a big part of uh, uh, the diet of people in Texas, okay? Well, even those that are trying to survive off of farming, subsistence farmers are going to find growing food in Texas is difficult because doesn't rain that often, especially a lot of, uh, in these areas around here. Now, La, La Bahia is going to get um, a lot more uh, rain than San Antonio, but San Antonio in particular, it can get really dry and it can go a lot of long time without rain. Well, fortunately for um, uh, people of San Antonio, there are going to be these acequias, and you can still see these today, where they'll build aqueducts from the rivers. But as we talked about, most of these things are built by uh, mission Indians. If you're a civilian settler, mission missionaries aren't going to let you use these acequias. Uh, a lot of times, sometimes they will, but a lot of times they won't. So, you know, you're going to face a lot of time uh, trouble getting water your crops sometimes. Inconsistent rain. Um, another problem with farming is the fact that, man, it's hot in Texas. All these areas are incredibly, incredibly hot. They're a lot hotter than it gets even in Spain. That's a hotter area 
hotter area and it's hotter than down here in Mexico most of this big settlements down here in New Spain are at high elevations meaning it's colder so you get down here the human body after a certain temperature certain humidity simply can't um, uh, work uh, that long and if you do try to work that long you a lot of times can get sick and you know get heat exhaustion and die and this is going to be especially a problem for civilian settlers around La Bahia again because disease is really pro prolific around here so there's only so much crops you can produce si simply because um, uh, simply because it, you know the weather and the climate uh, is going to prevent you from growing too much another problem for farmers here is Indians so initially this is going to be the Apaches imagine you're a farmer here you've uh, got a plot of land right outside of San Antonio maybe you're a Canary Islander maybe a descendant of him uh, or her a lot of Canary Islander women as we mentioned got uh, land and um, and you got a plot of land here you you're growing corn bean squash well Apaches a lot of times they need carbohydrates they can't get anywhere else so they're gonna come down here they're gonna raid take attack your farm take all your corn bean squash maybe soldiers are going to come back and, and be able to retaliate against them but as we mentioned soldiers poorly supplied uh, poorly led and a lot of times these guys are, are going to get off with the crops you just grown so again you don't even have enough crops left to survive yourself you're not going to be selling them to a different province um, you also have another problem for a lot of these farmers is that animals would eat their crops okay so initially this is going to be a problem because you'd have stuff like buffalo would graze on things like corn getting fields but a bigger problem is going to happen when we start to see cattle start uh, uh, roaming around the plains of Texas so initially cattle are not native to Texas the first time you're going to see cattle introduced and a couple have probably made their way up in the 1500s and 1600s from these settlements down here but the first that we know of are going to be brought to Texas uh, initially to East Texas by these missionaries but then in San Antonio once that's established you'll see these missionaries one of the things they want mission Indians to do is to herd cattle soldiers are also going to bring up cattle here to herd among their um, uh, herd among uh, outside the presidios uh, well when this cattle gets out here it's going to produce reproduce rapidly okay Texas has this grass that's just perfect for European cattle and what this cattle will do is start reproducing rapidly and growing a uh, couple thousand tens of thousands uh, initially it gets to the uh, point where there's so many cattle here and we talked about this before you're gonna have disputes over ownership of the cattle this is mine this is uh, this is mine um, well cattle grow so rapidly that you're gonna start to see civilians forget about farming I'm gonna raise cattle because there's so many of these things that um, you know I, I can uh, make some money off of it and one of the reasons it's gonna make cattle better than say growing watermelon squash beans is you can transport cattle easier than those things or at least it's gonna survive so say you get a couple hundred head of cattle here you can drive these things down to um, uh, where the, the large population centers are here down down in this area or you can drive the, the cattle over here to Los Ades or illegally to trade with the French over here this area over here when you start to get the wooded region cattle don't grow as well or as uh, rapidly as you do on the plains so you ship it over here the French uh, would be happy to trade European goods and nice stuff for this cattle and so we'll see some civilian settlers start getting into this uh, cattle trade okay so this starts to become one of the few ways that uh, uh, civilians make money in Texas and initially it's going to be um, the Canary Islanders who really start to make money off of it so they'll uh, unleash the cattle on their land but again back then there's not any barbed wire it's really hard to fence in your land so what would start to happen especially after disputes uh, arise between uh, missionaries soldiers civilian settlers and between civilian settlers themselves is you would start to see people just brand their cattle at a young age and then just unleash them and they would just start going out here on the plains and again uh, start doubling tripling quadrupling in population and then whenever you want to sell the cattle down here you just have this these roundups you just get a couple people together you round them up then you drive them to market alright so uh, people start to make money off cattle in Texas and I don't want to say a lot of money but it's just going to be a couple civilians making more uh, 
you know, uh, they're going to have the resources uh, to round these things up, you know, enough to hire ranch hands to help them uh, bring these cattle to market. Um, Again, sometimes the, the cattle, you know, you're supposed to have unique brands. A lot of the Canary Islanders uh, would come up with brands, and if you don't know what the brand is, just think about it as a letter, maybe with some unique marks on it. A lot of Spanish brands are kind of interesting because they incorporate Arabic symbols that are brought by uh, uh, the Moors during the Reconquista. But you would put a unique mark, you would brand it on a cattle, and then when you're rounding them up, you see this brand, you bring it in, and... Um, and then you can sell it at market and you can say this is my cattle because it has a brand. Sometimes you would see, you know, uh, people brand an animal a second time with over a, a simpler brand, like a simple brand that looks like an S. Well, you just say your brand looks like an 8. You just close the open ends of the S and say, oh, that's not your cattle, that's mine. Then you sell it at market. So there's a lot of disputes over um, things like that uh, in Spanish Texas. But some people start to make money off this. Some people, uh, particularly the Canary Islanders, they start acquiring more land uh, to raise cattle off of. And again, a lot of times there's going to be disputes because what if you have your cattle and it's branded your cattle, they wander onto somebody else's land, they eat all the grass on that land, and then you know the person that owns that land, they're trying to feed their own cattle, but most of their grass has been eaten up. That'll cause disputes. But again, some people will, will end up making uh, money off of it. And, and you'll have in Spanish Texas this rancher culture, or vaqueros. You'll sometimes hear the word cowboy. And all this cowboy culture in Texas, it actually begins right here in the mid-1700s with these vaqueros rounding up this cattle. We'll talk about this a little bit more later, but you start seeing particular kinds of cattle become more uh, uh, breeds become more popular in Texas breeds like the the longhorn because they survive with uh, less water over longer distances so if you're up here in San Antonio you're raising cattle you want to bring it to market you want, you're going to bring something that will uh, survive o over a long distance without uh, as much water we'll talk about that again in, in, in a little bit here so uh, you will see some people making money um, uh, making money here in Texas off uh, of cattle. Not many people though. Very small percentage of the Texas population. Now there are going to come some myths uh, along with this um, uh, this cattle expansion. If you go to Plains of Texas today, if you're somebody that has a relative or maybe you own some property uh, west of say Fort Worth, there's a big issue with mesquite trees. So the People used to think that mesquite trees were never, you would never see mesquite trees west of about this area. You would never see them out here. But then people s started seeing these mesquite trees, and it's such a problem that if you own land out here, you basically got to clear land off every, uh, every year, rip up these mesquite trees, or else your property that would normally be great you know, grassland and have grass everywhere is instead going to have these uh, trees everywhere where it's hard for cattle to move through them I and mean, your cattle don't thrive as much as they would on flat grasslands. Well, why is that the case? Why do ranchers have to worry about that? Because when the Spanish go out there, they didn't say anything about mesquite trees. Uh, when, when they first arrived, they didn't say anything about mesquite trees being in this area of Texas. They did talk about mesquite trees, though. Um, Cabeza de Vaca, as he's passing through Texas, particularly around this area, he mentioned these trees with these beans on them. We think he was talking about mesquite trees there. Well, why do we get them up here? How do we get them up here? Initially, before people read about, uh, went back and read Cabeza de Vaca, they thought that the first time we had mesquite trees anywhere in this area was when they were brought by Spanish first bringing cattle here in, into Texas. But they learned that, you know, that, that's not the case because there were mesquite trees here before the Spanish got there. What they thought was that the cows would eat mesquite beans, the beans would go through the cow's digestive tracts, they wouldn't get digested when the cow poops, the mesquite bean grows out of the poop, and um, you have mesquite trees. So they thought they were brought north by this cattle. Now they find out, all right, they're here in Texas, but they weren't at, as prolific, and they weren't everywhere they used to be. So how come it's the case that we only had a little bit in Cabeza de Vaca in the first Spaniards here in Texas, only describe a couple of mesquite trees, but nowadays... We have mesquite everywhere, and it's such a big nuisance that people have to, you know, go clear their fields every year. Well, what we think is that, and there's a lot of debate over this, we think that 
um, there's mesquite trees and farmers out here have, have to worry about it because cattle as the Spanish start uh, really bringing them here in the, in the middle of the six or I'm sorry middle of 1700s and the cattle start expanding growing in population they are going to start expanding the mesquite mesquite uh, trees a little bit but the main thing that's going to be helping the mesquite trees grow is that we think the cattle eat up a lot of these native grasses and the native vegetation that compete with the mesquite trees for sunlight and for water so let's imagine this area right here you know there's uh, grass but there's also a couple types of vegetation you wouldn't normally see there a couple things we might call weeds well the cows eat up those weeds and those weeds used to block the sunlight and would prevent let's say nine out of ten mesquite trees growing well the cattle eat those things up now you just have grass and mesquite trees mesquite trees no longer have competition for water or sunlight so the mesquite trees 10 out of 10 are going to survive unless a farmer or rancher rips them up and, and, and grows them. So we think it's the uh, cattle eating the vegetation uh, around the mesquite trees, not the actual, um, uh, not the fact that they're, uh, uh, you know, bringing the stuff in their digestive system. It's just that more cattle means uh, more eating of those weeds, which means uh, more uh, mesquite trees. Other um, debate is that uh, before cattle started coming to this area, this is again we're going to talk about tons of Apaches out here, and then later Comanches. They would have seasonal burnings in this region, and these this uh, seasonal burnings would burn down mesquite trees before they could grow uh, too large. But when the Indians went away, the seasonal burnings, which they would use to promote uh, uh, these grasses growing, that would help buffalo. Um, uh, you know, buffalo populations grow without the seasonal burnings. The um, uh, the mesquite trees don't get burned down and so they uh, they can grow that way. I, I think it's probably the cows growing and then uh, eating the competition for the grass in the uh, sunlight. So whatever the case we start seeing uh, cattle become such a big uh, a big thing that start seeing a number of ranches pop up outside of San Antonio and a lot of these ranches would look something like this. You would have uh, usually it would be wealthy person either Canary Islander or their kid or their grandkid um, would you know either take the land they were granted by Spain or expand upon it and uh, you know buy some land maybe they make some money off the cattle industry then they would build stone house maybe for the main family then they would have a, a side house would be maybe where the ranch hands would work a lot of these ranch hands would be the children of missionized Indians maybe civilian settlers that recently arrived up there um, but didn't get land for whatever reason. Um, maybe soldiers. A lot of soldiers, by the way, they're going to acquire land when they retire. Uh, maybe you're children of a soldier. Like, what if you're a soldier here that um, moves up to this region? And a lot of soldiers, by the way, um, you know, marry maybe a, a Hispanicized Indian woman from a mission. Uh, maybe you buy some land. Maybe you can uh, build your own ranch. Most of the ranch, ranches, however, are going to be uh, uh, descendants of those wealthy Canary Islanders. But yeah, the ranch hands work out here. And then the ranch hands would go out during the day. They would take the cattle, make sure they're uh, uh, you know, watered. Actually, uh, I shouldn't even say that because most of the time they just let the cattle roam. And the only time the ranch hands would do the work is whenever they had to gather the cattle up to drive them to market. Um, you know, other things like, you know, make sure the cattle uh, you know, uh, pregnancies, things like that. Uh, it, but uh, a lot of times it's uh, a branding. That'd be another thing these ranch hands do. Indians stealing cattle. A lot of times because these ranch ranches are going to be set up outside of San Antonio. Uh, soldiers aren't going to be able to spawn to Indian raids. So if you're the owner of the ranch, you call together the ranch hands and you go in pursuit of these various Indians. Okay? All right. So that's going to be... Um, uh, big profession here in Texas. So farmers, ranchers. Um, you will have a couple people in Texas that you would consider businessmen maybe. Um, they didn't have a lot of service industries like we have now. So today we have restaurants, we have um, uh, you know banks, we have um, we have you know, things that, that uh, uh, blacksmiths, well I guess not today blacksmiths, but we have you know plumbers, stuff like that. Back then if you had things you needed done, like uh, you need furniture made, you're probably going to do it yourself. You're making so little, you probably don't have extra money to be putting it for somebody else doing it, so you're cooking your own food, things like that. However, you are going to have 
a handful of people, and this is going to be usually around government centers or maybe around presidios, uh, places like this downtown San Antonio, where you would have maybe somebody who would run a laundry or something. So if you have elites, they need to get their clothes washed. Uh, you know, maybe um, you, you bring them to someone, you pay them a couple pesos or whatever, they wash your clothes. You would maybe have somebody set up a small restaurant, you know, for, for a bakery, something like that, in downtown San Antonio. So you would see some service industry, but there's, there's going to be incredibly few people. Maybe a blacksmith shop would be set up in downtown San Antonio. Most of the time, these are going to be these duties are going to be done by the people themselves, or you know, if you're like a, somebody who owns a ranch, you'd probably have somebody on staff that a uh, ranch hand or whatever that would do those jobs. So you would see a couple service industry jobs. So this is the life of people in Texas. Um, there's going to be a couple other things affecting life in Texas for besides professions. Uh, in particular, you're going to see things like class affecting life in Texas. As we've been talking about, you are going to have a handful of wealthy people in Texas. These are, again, primarily the people of uh, Canary Islanders and their descendants, uh, the people that own wealthy uh, ranches. You are going to have a handful of people sometimes government officials, maybe a governor or maybe a sub-official of a governor, maybe his personal secretary, they'll make a little bit of money. And a lot of times what these wealthy individuals would do is they would have homes in downtown San Antonio. So downtown San Antonio is going to be based around where the governor works, Presidio, and the uh, one of the missions, the uh, thing we're going to be known as the Alamo, that starts to be formed as the center of San Antonio. And um, uh, most of the wealthy people within San Antonio, and this goes to a lesser extent, Los Ades and uh, La Bahia, would live in the city center, and they would actually live in stone buildings like this, or uh, well-constructed adobe homes. Part of the reason for this is because this is the furthest you can get from Indian attacks, and it's the closest you can get to the Presidio, which would offer soldiers protections, uh, or the soldiers would be able to protect it much better than, say, if you were on the outskirts of town. So that's part of the reason you're going to see the best built and um, the wealthiest citizens live in, in downtown San Antonio. What you actually have a lot of times is the wealthiest citizens would own their ranches outside of town, but they'd also own homes within downtown San Antonio as well. So we go to the ranch for part of the year, maybe when the Indians they do seasonal raids you know maybe this is a time of year where the Indians don't raid so that's when we go to the ranch but when the Indians start raiding we move in here to downtown we leave the ranch hands out there to defend the ranch but we come in here where it's safe in the city center so this is going to be wh where the wealthy citizens live downtown San Antonio downtown La Bahia uh, Los Ades like, is almost so small that you there's not really a downtown but if you are wealthy in Los Ades that's where you would be living uh, the poor people in um, Texas are going to be living in the outskirts of town and they're not going to be living in nice adobe homes uh, right beside the Presidio. They're going to be living you know on the outskirts um, in these what you call jacal homes uh, made of mud maybe some uh, wood that's sort of stuck together with mud, straw roofs things that you know you slap together on a budget a lot of times maybe not on, even on their own property maybe just um, they're working for somebody else and they slap up these homes so if you are somebody like a um, Hispanicized Indian so maybe your your parents uh, entered a mission you were raised in the mission you're fully Hispanicized or Catholic maybe at a certain age the priests say are right, you're fully Hispanicized you go work for somebody in town you may be um, uh, work for a Canary Islander as a housekeeper or maybe you work uh, as a ranch hand part of the year maybe you work for somebody on, on their farm part of the year you make a small wage you would live in one of these to call homes maybe you have a small plot of land just enough to grow enough food for you and your family and you're gonna live in something like this that barely provides shelter uh, overhead so there's gonna be a very big class divide between the the haves and have-nots in Texas so that's going to be one thing you need to consider um, uh, in life in Spanish Texas. Another thing that's going to be a reality of life in Spanish Texas is going to be gender. Okay, so most of the class have been talking about men in Spanish Texas, and that's because uh, Spanish society was very 
male-centric. Men were deemed to be those who are going to be involved in politics, business, uh, and is going to be left up to women to make the home and to raise the children. All right, so men uh, go off. They're going to be the ones raising uh, cattle. They're going to be the one planting crops. A lot of times, by the way, in some of these uh, Indian societies, uh, around the Spanish, you're going to have men and women both uh, planting crops, but in Spanish society, no, that's the men's job. Women are going to be there to uh, make clothing. Again, very rarely are people buying their clothing so far out here on the frontier. So women make clothing. They make dinner. Uh, in this scene right here, you have a woman. She's got what this is called a matate. This is going to be a, a big job for women. Uh, the father of the family goes out. He uh, grows some corn, comes in, uh, dried out, woman will be uh, forced to kneel on her her, uh, her knees and you know uh, a lot of times it's elbows as well and they're gonna grind the corn into meal and then turn it into this corn flour this corn paste and then they'll you know make tortillas over this you know uh, a lot of times you know maybe the cattle come in uh, cattle um, be butchered out here woman come in forced to uh, it's not even forced it's sort of the the role in society uh, to uh, cook the food and uh, and then she's also going to be the one to raise the children so uh, children especially younger years will be taken care of by the mother once they're of working age they'll join the father and whatever the job is to um, uh, the, whatever job the father's doing so that's going to be the role of most women now there is going to be a class divide among women you are going to have a very small handful of women in Spanish Texas that are of European ancestry. White women uh, is, is what uh, they referred to them back then. So women of European ancestry, maybe either straight from Spain or from New Spain that are of parents of European ancestry. So usually these women of European ancestry, sometimes they would have some education. They would be responsible for raising the children, making the house, but sometimes they would have other um, uh, roles outside of uh, the home like you would have social functions like uh, women would sometimes put on uh, balls and join their husbands uh, the wealthier European descendant women uh, would join their husbands they would sometimes help their husbands with work sometimes the wealthier women would receive education uh, that goes for uh, wealthier men as well you would see them sometimes receive private tutoring this is going to be a small percentage of uh, women and men but you are going to have a handful of uh, women of uh, European ancestry most women in Texas however are not going to be those of European ancestry. Generally, the, the only ones that are going to be European ancestry are the wives of governors, maybe the wives of presidio commanders, um, maybe uh, descendants of those Canary Islander women. But most women in Texas are going to be uh, of Indian ancestry or mixed Indian European ancestry. As a matter of fact, a lot of the women you'll see in Texas, soldiers, maybe they retire to Texas, they marry a uh, second generation uh, Mission Indian woman and they start a family there and so their children will be of mixed European uh, uh, European Indian ancestry um, sometimes you would have you know men marry uh, women Indian women from central New Spain uh, bring those women up here on the frontier uh, if you are Indian mixed race woman here on the frontier again your primary job is to take care of the homes for men sometimes you would see uh, women taking small jobs like if the husband uh, say he's a Presidio soldier or let's say he's you know uh, got a government job or something um, in downtown San Antonio you'd sometimes see women out of, out of their home be seamstresses fix garments sometimes you would see them be uh, running laundries or preparing food but usually those types of jobs are left to the men um, when it is you do have women in, in business it is usually going to be sort of domesticated uh, uh, t style business laundry uh, cooking uh, you know sewing clothes things like that that's just sort of the Spanish system they regarded certain tasks as being up to men others they left for women now it's kind of interesting because women in Spanish society are gonna have certain rights that women in other colonial societies don't have so by this point uh, the English, British uh, are settling on the east coast of North America and you have the French in Louisiana and in Canada. Well, women, particularly in British society, a lot of times they're going to be denied property rights. So if you're a woman born in British Massachusetts, your husband dies, 
you're probably not going to inherit the property. It'll probably go directly to your son or, if you don't have a son yet, maybe to your husband's brother, uh, maybe your father. You're not going to inherit the property. That's not the case in Spanish society, and this goes actually way back to the Reconquista. Uh, so many men were dying in battle with the Moors that you know, they'd leave their wives without property, that the Spanish king and queen um, uh, basically ruled that uh, women are going to be able to inherit their husband's property, and these laws are going to be taken over to the New World. So it's kind of interesting. If you're a woman in Spanish Texas, you don't have certain opportunities. You're not going to have as much opportunity for education as you would maybe in uh, British colonies, but you are going to have certain property rights. And it's kind of interesting, as a woman in Spanish society, generally you're not going to be able to get divorced from your husband. Even today, a lot of Catholic countries don't allow divorce. But on the frontier, there are certain ways to protect yourself from things like domesticate, domestic abuse. So let's say your husband's beating you. You could appeal to the governor and uh, uh, or a local uh, city councilman or the call day, which is essentially the mayor of the town. What they would do is they would assemble um, a jury. They would, um, not exactly a jury, but close enough. And they would take testimony from you and your husband, and they could rule your husband's in the wrong. He could get thrown in jail. Um, they could grant separations, not official divorces, although you would occasionally see divorces in certain instances. Um, you know, a lot of times those are going to be if you know the man is uh, uh, physically unable to produce children. Sometimes you'd see divorces for extreme cases of domestic abuse. Uh, you would see divorces, but usually they'll give uh, women certain property, and uh, will grant them a legal separation, although uh, most of the time this didn't mean that you could get remarried. And a lot of times you don't see that in, in uh, British society or French society. So especially out here on the frontier where everybody knows everybody, the population so small, you would see um, some allowances being granted uh, women. So in some ways uh, life as a woman is more difficult in Spanish colonies, but in other ways it's better than uh, women in British colonies. So this is going to be another fact you should consider here in Colonial Texas. Another issue to consider in Colonial Texas is the issue of race. Okay, The people of Texas are going to essentially live in a racial hierarchy that has been imparted on the New World by the Spanish. And this is going to be a racial hierarchy that goes back all the way to the Reconquista. So during the Reconquista, you had these Moors invade Spain. The Moors were various uh, races, Arab, um, also Sub-Saharan African, black. Um, they were, again, also some white Arabs. And you would have, uh, uh, or Europeans, uh, you would say, European Moors. Um, and you would have uh, these generally darker skinned, however, groups invaded Spain. And during the Reconquista, you had the various Christian kingdoms, which were mostly white Europeans fighting against these darker skinned uh, Moors. Well, this imparted this sort of racial hierarchy on Spain. Generally, those who are of limpieza de sangre, or clean, cleanness of blood, are going to be regarded as, you know, the Christian, the good guys, these are the guys that fought against the Moors, and those with darker skin are going to be regarded as Moors themselves. So those are the invaders. It formed, the invasion of the Moors, the Reconquista, formed this sort of racial view of skin color in Spain. So um, that was in Spain. That same idea will be brought to the Americas. We talked about this a little bit before. The Spanish saw the Indians as um, you know darker skin. They saw them as not equal to Europeans. Uh, they used this to enslave them, although Indian slavery had gone away. We talked about with the new laws. But still, Indians were going to be deemed in Spanish society not able to hold certain positions in government and in a lot of uh, ways only able to perform certain jobs. So Indians were viewed as lesser than than uh, whites. And in general, uh, all races that are non-white, uh, non-European, are going to be regarded as lesser than in Spanish society. So this started in Europe. It's going to be brought to the Americas. Well, the thing that's going to happen in the Americas is what you'll see is because of conditions in the Americas, there are large Indian population, even after disease hits, especially in New Spain, you're going to have you know, uh, these large populations of Indians. And a lot of the first people to come over 
a lot of the first Spaniards to come over were men, and there's going to be a lot of sexual relations between uh, Indian women and uh, European men, and so you had a lot of uh, uh, racial intermixing, for lack of a better term, and this is going to form uh, mixed race people and you also you start seeing the introduction of African slaves and you had the same thing there uh, uh, you know uh, mixed African European ancestry and in some cases mixed African and Indian ancestry so instead of having white skin dark skin what you started to have in New Spain and throughout the Spanish Americas is um, mixed race people well the Spanish are going to have a hard time understanding how to deal with these people in their society where you have European equals superior, darker skin people mean inferior. So what the Spanish are going to come up with, and this isn't something that just began immediately, it's going to start in the Reconquista, but it's really going to hit its stride in the 1700s, is something called the caste system, caste system. And what the caste system will be is a racial and social classification for the people of the Americas. And what it's going to do is say certain people of certain races are going to be qualified for X position. People of different races are going to be qualified for this position. And um, what it's going to attempt to do is say if you are of, let's say for example here, half Indian ancestry, half Spanish ancestry, you are a mestizo. So it's going to be a common classification in New Spain. Um, you're a mestizo if you're of these. Well, if you're Spanish, pure Spanish ancestry, you can serve certain positions of government. You can do whatever, basically. If you're Indian, you're going to be unable to serve as you know uh, certain positions in government. You're not going to be able to serve certain jobs. If you're mestizo, depending on time period it is, some ways it's going to be regarded as superior to Indian. Although, in a lot of times in the Spanish caste system, the uh, those of mixed race will be regarded as uh, having the negative qualities of both uh, both races. So maybe a mestizo, and again, I, I, I apologize, this is sort of a, a convoluted, silly uh, silly system, but sometimes the uh, mestizos will be regarded as, uh, you know, uh, greedy like the Spanish or, or something like that, uh, and then... Um, uh, lazy like Indians. That would be another one one uh, accusation you would see for mestizos. Um, so again, there's going to be trying to take a very complicated racial system and classify it. Um, mestizo with Espanol, Carrizo. That's a, that's another example. Um, sometimes, by the way, with these caste systems, you could have uh, so so much intermixing or that you actually return to the initial classification. So if, look at an example here. We have Spanish and Indian and Mestizo. Mestizo with a Spaniard would be uh, Carrizo uh, or Castizo. There you go. Castizo with the Spanish would become Spanish again. Okay. Uh, a, a Spanish with a more and that would be a term for Sub-Saharan African black. You have mulatto. That's So that'd be a person of mixed European ancestry. And then uh, you hear a different classification here, a different classification here, and you have, um, uh, again, uh, different classifications for Indian and black and, and, and things like that. And it was an attempt to, you know, bring structure to this uh, uh, complicated racial system. But he, making things even more complicated is the fact that you would have actually subdivisions of r the races, okay? So, for example, being Spanish wasn't just being Spanish. It, it didn't just mean being white. So being white wasn't just being white. If you were an Espanol or you were a Blanco uh, white, you could be a two different types of white. You could be Espanol or Peninsulare is going to be the most commonly used term. Peninsulares were those who were actually born in Spain itself. So actually born on the peninsula of Iberia. These peninsulares are actually going to be considered the highest of this racial hierarchy Spain sets up. So if you're born in Spain, you can achieve just about any position in the Americas. Let's say you're born in Madrid, you come over here, you start serving as a secretary to a governor. Then um, the Spanish are looking for a governor, maybe even the viceroy. They'll appoint you if you're a peninsulari. And the way they want to appoint people born in Spain is because they trust them. Peninsulares are seen as Spain wants to make sure that the stuff coming from their empire and their colonies 
is going back to Spain and is go doing good for the Spanish. Um, they don't want people to do what's in the best interest of the people of the Americas. So if you're born in the Americas, you might do what's best for your homeland, but if you're born in Spain, you're, Spain is going to trust you to do the high-level jobs and do what's good for the people of the home country. So certain types of jobs are going to be reserved only for these peninsulares. Um, peninsulares, again, governors are going to almost always be peninsulares. Um, uh, viceroys, exclusively peninsulares. And these peninsulares, because they hold these government positions, because they're held in such esteem with this weird class slash racial system, that um, uh, they're usually going to be the wealthiest within Spain. Now, there's going to be almost no peninsulares in Spanish Texas simply because being so remote, so little money-making opportunities, most peninsulares will stay in central uh, New Spain or around the silver mining area. Most peninsulares you see in Texas are uh, governors, maybe uh, a position that works for the governor, maybe a couple presidial commanders would be peninsulares. Um, most people of European ancestry in Texas um, are going to be classified as white under Spain, but they're going to be what they would call criollos. Criollos. So criollos are essentially people with pure European ancestry. So um, everybody in your you know, your uh, lineage for a thousand plus years uh, can uh, claim somebody that is from Europe. So there's no Indian uh, African ancestry. So criollos are heritage and genetics sim exactly identical to peninsulares, but they were born in the Americas. Because of the simple fact they're born in the Americas, Spain will say, we can't trust them to do what's good in the best interest of Spain. If they're born in Texas, you know, say you're a descendant of the Canary Islanders, Canary Islanders are considered entirely European. Um, uh, but if you're born in Texas, you're probably not going to do, you're probably going to do what's in the best interest of Texas and not what's in the best interest of Spain. So Criollos in general, they will be able to hold certain government positions like um, uh, assistant to the governor, like maybe uh, maybe presidio commanders, a lot of times presidio commanders, uh, but governor, you're not going to serve as governor. They don't trust you to hold that, that high of a a political position. Sometimes you would see it if there was a, a certain an emergency or something like that, but almost immediately be placed by peninsulares. Well, uh, Criollos, um, part because uh, the Spanish system holds them in high regard, uh, at least when compared to other other races. Uh, also, in part because they're descendants of people with wealth. Also, um, again, the law is is going to favor them in certain matters. They're not going to be as wealthy as peninsulares. They're not going to be holding the top positions, but they are going to be the ones to own the businesses. They are going to be the ones to own a lot of land. So, for example, in Texas, uh, the Penins uh, uh, the Criollos, uh, the Canary Islanders, their descendants would be considered Criollos because they're all born in Texas, uh, they're, but they're all genetically European. Um, but they are going to own a lot of property, a lot of land. They are going to be wealthy. It's just they're not going to be as wealthy as maybe the peninsulari who's serving as governor, uh, or maybe you know um, somebody down south, uh, a little bit further, a peninsulari that owns a mine or something like that. So think of Criollos as sort of the middle class of Texas and New Spain. All right, um, there's going to be a lot of I wouldn't say. Let me. Most people in mid 1700s in Texas that would declare allegiance to Spain would be. Criollos. Well, actually, population-wise, I'm going to give an estimate here. I don't have exact numbers. Let's say about 50% of people in Texas would be uh, Criollos uh, in the mid-1700s. The next step down on um, the Spanish hierarchy in this caste system would be these mestizos. Mestizos would be, say, a Canary Islander had an extramarital affair with an Indian woman. Product of that would be a mestizo, so it's got European ancestry, got Indian ancestry, or maybe a soldier marries an Indian woman, has been Hispanicized into mission, they have a child that's considered a mestizo. Mestizos can hold certain jobs in the Spanish system. They can serve as soldiers. So probably not going to serve as officers, but they can serve as soldiers. A lot of times mestizos will be um, branch hands or something like that. So it's almost like a lower middle class or maybe upper lower class in Spanish society. Mestizos in general are not going to be trusted with being officers in the military. Certainly not commanders of presidios uh, and almost never will you see them in, in uh, any government uh, position. So think of it maybe upper lower class. Uh, lower in Spanish society this would be maybe a mestizo style home 
uh, these sort of Jakal homes. This is probably the best you can expect if you were born of uh, mixed Indian European ancestry. Lower on that list is going to be Indians that are Hispanicized. Okay, so um, let's say your and parents went to a, a mission. Uh, over time, they became Hispanicized, learned to speak Spanish, learned Catholicism, learned how things run in the Spanish uh, Spanish government. But um, uh, they have you as a child. You're pure Indian ancestry. Well, what Indians are usually going to be? You're, you're released from the mission. Uh, you no longer go to the mission anymore. You have almost no opportunity to escalate yourself in Spanish society. You're not going to be uh, allowed certain government positions. They they simply won't uh, allow Indians to serve in them. There's this distrust. You know, if they get higher up, then maybe they'll turn on us. Um, you are not going to be trusted for a lot of jobs. So let's say there's a Criollo looking to hire a ranch hand. You got a mestizo over here, Indian over here. Most of the time, they'd go with a mestizo. Uh, when you do have Indian laborers, it's usually going to be for manual labor jobs. So maybe a farmer that owns a ranch needs somebody to help them uh, during harvest time. You'd hire an Indian laborer, but a lot of times you'd hire these laborers on a, a seasonal basis you would not paying very much and a lot of times what would happen to these Indian laborers is because they're sort of marginalized in Spanish society that they would be forced to uh, work under they would have to take almost any job they can get to help survive so the, whatever is going to provide them with food and a lot of times the jobs are going to be uh, working for a farmer and the farmer will force them to now work for them or, I mean they'll voluntarily work for them but then the farmer while they're working for them is going to make sure that they buy their food from the farmer, make sure they maybe buy their clothing from the farmer. And a lot of times what you see happen to these Hispanicized Indian workers is they become debt peons. Like they start working for somebody, this person requires them to buy from them, especially on the larger ranches where you get to the point where you have like company stores, and they'll say, all right, you need to replace your clothing. This clothing is overpriced X amount. Well, you buy the clothing. I don't have enough money. Okay, well, pay me out of your future wages. So uh, next season comes along. You get your money. This guy will take 90% of it. Um, and then, you know, the remaining 10 cents, well, you're, you're going to be, 10% uh, is going to be what's your left to feed your family. Well, then you, uh, following season, you got to borrow even more money. Pretty soon you're in debt and you're not even working for money. You're working simply to pay off your debt. Maybe you die and then your child will be left with that debt. They're going to be forced to work for this guy. So if you become Hispanicized, it, it, you're... There's not a lot of way out of this debt peonage. And so that's going to be reserved for a lot of Indians. And again, there's, you're not going to have representation because the Spanish don't uh, have government positions that are going to allow for Indians. Now, in some societies um, uh, or some parts of New Spain where there's larger percentage of Indians, you would have separate Indian communities and you would have Indian leaders over those separate Indian communities. But you don't see that in, in Spanish Texas because either the Indians become Hispanicized or they sort of stay away from the Spaniards and, and don't even, uh, you know, deal with them uh, very often. So, uh, you know, uh, Indians, it, it, you're not going to have that, I guess, in Spanish Texas. So let's not even worry about that. All right. So um, there are going to be some Indians, I should say, in Spanish society that will receive certain rights. Like you will have a handful of these Tlaxcalan Indians. Uh, those are the those who helped Cortez defeat the Aztecs. Um, you will have a couple arrive up there and, and you will see them allowed to serve in certain positions like as soldiers whereas the Spanish aren't going to allow most Indians to serve as soldiers even in presidios because they don't trust most Indians even Hispanicized ones with firearms sometimes in Spanish Texas though because of the desperate need for soldiers you will occasionally see full-blooded Indians uh, as long as they're Hispanicized served in presidio so because of the frontier situation there will be some exceptions sort of lower on the Spanish hierarchy. Uh, this would be uh, Hispanicized Indians. Uh, uh, this would be a picture from uh, mid-1800s of a, a Mexican settlement. So uh, that would be uh, Hispanicized Indians. Uh, even lower on the Spanish hierarchy are going to be uh, sub-Saharan Africans, blacks. Um, there's not going to be a lot of blacks in Spanish Texas simply because um, most Africans, and as we talked about during the new laws, Spain had started bringing um, this this uh, slave trade. Uh, they had started enslaving blacks. Portuguese did as well because they're not Christians. Started to bring them to the new world, uh, replace Tainos with uh, black workers, and um, 
you know, using physical violence, things like that, had um, uh, created the sugar industry in the Caribbean. Um, when the new laws came out and said no longer can you keep sla Indians as slaves, they did not say that to blacks because uh, the Spanish said old world people had a chance to learn Christianity, they rejected it. Now, that wasn't true for people in sub-Saharan Africa, but the Spanish sort of made this exception. So you saw millions of slaves being brought to Spanish colonies in the Americas. Some are going to be brought to Mexico, but initially because uh, of the large population in central Mexico, even after nine out of ten people died in Mesoamerica, there's so many people down there, that's going to lead a lot of laborers, and so the Spanish initially enslaved those laborers, but then even after slavery's ended, because of debt peonage, there's no reason to import an African slave, which is a costly endeavor, when I can just find this Indian uh, debt peon and force them to work for me. So there wasn't as many blacks brought to um, uh, New Spain in the first place. Those that were usually in coastal regions uh, where Indians, uh, uh, because of the disease thing, would die in droves. But there are going to be a couple, and you would see uh, between these slaves um, some... Uh, you know, uh, intermixing with uh, Europeans and, and product of this union would be called mulattoes, again, on that weird racial hierarchy. So um, the thing is, if you're a slave brought to New Spain or anywhere in the Spanish Empire, you actually are, in some ways, have it better off than if you're a slave brought to British colony. In British colonies, there wasn't the influence of the Catholic Church. And so if you're brought to a British colony, you probably have very little chance to gain your freedom uh, you have very little uh, legal authority under the law. Well, the Catholic Church, even though it's continued to say that it's okay to enslave Africans, there is going to be some laws against mistreating slaves. Like the Catholic Church, if there's a priest around and he sees you mistreating your slaves, then he could bring that to the attention of the government. The government could say, uh, don't mistreat your slaves. Uh, they will encourage slave owners to allow their uh, slaves to work a day a week uh, themselves and then buy their way out of freedom or buy the way to freedom so in some ways you could buy your way um, uh, to freedom as a, as a slave much easier than you could in British America in general the Spanish and the French to this is also is they would free the children of um, uh, of uh, interracial unions they would free them way more often than you would see in British society so you do have your chance to gain uh, freedom more in Spanish society um, but a lot of times the work in Spanish society, especially sugar cane, is going to be more difficult than you see in, in a lot of these British colonies. All right, so um, uh, this is the situation for blacks in, in uh, New Spain. Again, a lot enslaved. Some are going to be free by the mid-1700s. But um, not very many people are going to bring slaves to Texas. There's a couple reasons for this. It's, now, there's workers needed in Texas. Um, you know, you only have so many missionized Indians. But the, and you know, you can grow cash crops up there, although sugar doesn't grow as well up there. But the main reason is going to be that if you, it's expensive to bring slaves to Texas. So basically, you have to bring a slave from Africa, uh, transfer them through Veracruz, bring them all the way up to Texas, and then you're risking them dying to an Indian attack. Uh, so, Oh, and you get up there, not a lot of people are going to Texas that anyway because if you're wealthy, if you're somebody who can afford a slave, why not you know purchase a silver mine and then you can use your slave to get silver from the mine and then make a lot more money than you could uh, bring a slave to Texas where the only profitable industry is, uh, is the um, cattle industry, but that's not very labor intensive. So almost no one brought slaves to Texas. Now if you go through the old censuses, you will see couple, maybe less than a dozen at one time, uh, slaves in Texas, and you can actually go through some of these old records and you can, uh, you know, see how slaves have certain rights that you don't see in, in other areas like the, the British colonies, uh, how they would protest to the government if their master's mistreating them, uh, but there's only going to be a handful of, of uh, Africans in Texas. So, uh, and again, uh, because of that racial hierarchy, Slaves um, uh, are going to be lowest at the, uh, sort of the second socioeconomic totem pole, and even those uh, slaves that do get their freedom, and a handful will, 
uh, in the 1700s, early 1800s, even the, those are going to be uh, like uh, Indians, full-blooded Indians, denied government positions and sort of treated as uh, subservient positions. Okay. All right. So this is um, uh, sort of the lowest rung of this weird caste system in Texas. Well, there's not. This doesn't include everybody in Spanish Texas. Obviously, most of the population of the place Spain would call Texas lives outside of the Spanish sphere of influence. You have these Indios or Indios Barbaros, and we're going to talk a lot more about these guys later. You have the guys that, you know, like the Apaches, Caddos, who said, thank you, but no thank you, we don't want missionaries, Caranquas. Um, most people that didn't said didn't adhere to Spain's rules and, and just sort of went on their own in Spain because they don't exert as much control in Texas as they would like. It's sort of this backwater province. These Indios Barbaros, and they call them barbarians. The word barbarian goes way back to Greek times. Um, uh, these barbarians, they would call them without reason or whatever, and so they couldn't classify them as, um, as a uh, uh, in their system because they existed outside of the system. There are going to be a couple of, uh, of uh, Indian barbarians that you will see in Spanish towns, and these would be groups you would call Henizaros. And these are Indians, let's say the Spanish soldiers go, the uh, Apaches have raided a Spanish ranch or a Spanish town. They go attack an Indian encampment. They, um, uh, most of the Indians get away or, you know, they kill them, but they find an Apache child or a young Apache or they capture an Apache adult. Uh, usually it's not adults, usually it's women and children. What do we do with the, these people? Well, Spain says you're not supposed to treat them as slaves, but if you let them go, they're going to you know, join others in raiding you soon enough. So what the Spanish would often do is they'd actually take these Henizaros or these Apaches as domestic servants and force them to live in Spanish homes. Usually it was in the homes of wealthy, and they couldn't leave, so it was almost like a... Uh, slaves as well, but it, again, it doesn't fit normally into this this uh, caste system. Uh, there's also other groups in, in Spanish Texas we didn't talk that sort of exist outside of this system. They're Ladinos, these groups that would run away from missions. They knew how to speak Spanish. They knew uh, worse European style clothing. It's just they ran away. Um, those are going to be treated as something different and not uh, fit along with this this uh, unusual caste systems. Okay. All right, so making this uh, system even more complicated is the fact that in this caste system, you could actually uh, earn your way to a different race, okay? Class and race al almost got mixed in the Spanish system. So, for example, let's say you were uh, a mestizo. Let's say your father was um, a criollo. Um, he was born in Texas, maybe born as a child of a Canary Islanders. He had a sexual relation with a Hispanicized Mission Indian woman. You're the product of it. And it's going to show when you get baptized, the priest is going to say, all right, this person is a mestizo. They're going to write that down. Well, as a mestizo, you're not allowed certain government positions. You're probably not going to be allowed as officer of a uh, presidio, anything like that, or officer in the Spanish army. Well, let's say as a mestizo, you happen to inherit your father's fortune and you know your father defies normal uh, rules maybe his uh, fully uh, Criollo children or fully uh, Spanish children uh, uh, die and he's got to leave it to somebody he leaves it to you so now you're becoming wealthy or, or let's say uh, maybe you join as, as a mestizo you become just a regular soldier in a presidio but you perform well on a campaign you become known as a particularly effective soldier you become a hero well, now you have um, wealth. Maybe now you're a hero. Well, what you'll sometimes see is Spanish uh, censuses. The same guy that was written down as a mestizo at birth, well, he's, he's gained status in society. Maybe now he's written down as a Spaniard or as a Criollo uh, on the next census because he's risen himself in status in society because Spain associated status with race. Um, uh, this allows him to uh, gain a higher position. Now maybe he can serve as commander of the Presidio. He's sort of gotten out of this weird caste system. He's sort of evolved beyond it to uh, assume a higher position. Same thing you would see with maybe you are born um, uh, mixed uh, African Indian ancestry. Well, maybe uh, one you perform well in battle. 
maybe you, next thing you become a mestizo. Now you can, you know, uh, serve in uh, in a presidio. Uh, maybe you you make money somehow, uh, and, and eventually you get your way up to uh, becoming a Spaniard. So it was class is tied with race, race is tied with class. Very very confusing thing. Okay, so. In a lot of ways, this is going to dictate life in Spanish society in Texas because, uh, again, you know, if you're born one way, it's very hard to make your way, uh, elevate yourself. If you're born full-blooded Indian, uh, if you're of African ancestry, it's, it's hard to uh, uh, make your way uh, way to the top. So that's one way this caste system is going to affect Texas. Uh, another way it's going to affect Texas is if you're somebody like Criollos. Criollos are going to be educated a lot of time they're going to have wealth a lot of these descendants of canary islanders wealthy at least comparative wealthy in texas they'll get education have private tutors but they're not going to be allowed to serve as governor they're not going to have a chance to serve as viceroy those guys with education a lot of them are going to start being upset they're going to look at these peninsulares and they're going to start to say well i can do that guy's job why am I denied these certain positions? Why can't I serve as governor? And there's going to be a lot of resentment, particularly between Criollos and Peninsulares, but certainly resentment among uh, mestizos and Indians uh, for um, uh, against whites as well. Um, now, all this is going to factor into Texas, but one final thing you know about Texas is while these caste system and these racial hierarchy and this weird stuff is going to play a factor in Texas, it's not going to be as pronounced as some, some other places, like places like central Mexico, uh, where you have more uh, interracial uh, uh, mixing, you'll have um, uh, you know uh, deeper class divides. In Texas, because there's not a whole heck of a lot of wealthy people, and because everybody um, is faced with a lot of problems, not making very much money, Indian attacks, you're not going to see this class and race divides and because people are going to have to rely on everybody to contribute to fighting off Apaches, to surviving, to watching for the French, all these different types of things, you're not going to see the resentment you see as much as in other areas again like central New Spain. So the caste system is absolutely important to Texas, but it's not going to be cause as many problems as you will see in less dangerous more class uh, structured areas of the Spanish Empire.